Okay, uh, let's get started. It's nine o'clock here, so we'll go. We only have half an hour, um, so I'll try to take about 20 minutes for the talk, and then we'll leave a little bit for questions. So this is generating dynamic Drupal installers. Um, and we will be using Composer and trying to make dynamic installers that are better than sort of standard distributions that work with Drupal. Um, these are some of the links uh, for stuff we'll be going over. They'll also be at the end of this slide and then I'll post the slides, of course. Um, you don't need these links to follow along with the talk. So what is the point of all this? Um, why are we gonna do dynamic installers? So um, the company I work for, uh, Acromedia, a typical project for us doesn't just, isn't just a standard um, basic composer install out of the box. We usually have somewhere between three and six repositories that have been added. It could be, you know, we're adding NPM uh, dependencies. We're adding a couple of, you know, dependencies direct from version control maybe, you know, custom libraries or, you know, third party stuff from a client that isn't on Packagist. Um, you know, there might even be a private repo. Uh, we probably require about 40 different, you know, modules, libraries, stuff. Um, we have dev requirements as well. We might even be adding an extra autoloader. Um, there's probably quite a few scripts for install paths and stuff that comes from Drupal. Um, and then we might be running quite a few patches. I went over a number of our product projects and we might be running 20 up to even like 40 patches if we have a large suite of modules and stuff hasn't made its way through to stable releases. And so all that means that the composer setup is actually pretty complex and there's a lot going on you know, more so than just a, a theme and a couple of prepackaged modules. And so these come from a number of different places too. Um, so if you take a project that we've worked on and you look backwards, there's stuff that's specific to the project, there's stuff that's specific to our internal development process, there's stuff that comes from Drupal Commerce because we usually work with Drupal Commerce, um, there's stuff that just comes from the composer scaffolding that's been made for Drupal if you're using like a Drupal Create project. Um, and then there's the stuff that just comes from Drupal core to make Drupal work with Composer at all. So there's all these pieces that need to go together and if you wanna change something in one of those middle layers, it's not that easy. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, you go, oh, well, Composer, I can just add, you know, my Composer files from my modules or libraries and stuff and they can add lots of stuff. It, that's true and that's not true. Um, there are lots of options that are basically what they call root only options, which are things that can only be controlled by the root composer file of the project, which is things like adding an additional repo, file structures, extras, patches, dev requirements, scripts, auto orders, you know, all those things that I listed as being part of the project. Um, and so you can't do any of those just with a download. You need to make those in your root. And so if you want people to add those, you need to like put those in your readme and say, hey, go into your root composer, you know, copy paste this, put it in, you know, run this command again, and it's, it's pretty difficult, people don't usually Need, want, read the README, they just want it to install and work. Um, and so we're gonna discuss some ways where we can generate these composer files dynamically so that we can get around all these problems. Um, and it's like, okay, so why can't I just make a distribution that could add some of this stuff? Um, I mean, you can, you can put custom settings in your composer file for your distribution. You know, you can have all this stuff you know, and if you have people download your specific composer file, um, they could have all this. It's just that it has to be exactly the way your distribution said it was, and if they wanna add something else, now we're back to those manual steps that they have to do it again. You've sort of made like a fork of Drupal. You know, your distribution isn't quite the same now as stock Drupal, it's your specific distribution. You know, maybe things don't work quite the same you know, if someone wants to merge two things together, now they have to manually take all this stuff and they have to add them together. So, you know, that's okay as long as you don't want to, you know, deviate from the distribution too much. But kind of the whole point of Drupal is it's super modular and you do whatever you feel like. And this kind of goes against that. So, okay, what should we do instead? Then that was just listing off a bunch of problems. Um, we had this same sort of problem uh, with doing stuff for Drupal Commerce. There were, we had a Commerce Kickstart for Drupal 7, um, but we didn't want to do that for Drupal 8 because we, we knew all these problems that I just listed. So we're like, well, what can we do instead? Um, you know, how can we build this more dynamically? And it's like, okay, well, maybe we can build these composer files out. 
you know, we can dynamically create them. They're pretty simple. They're just JSON. You know, we could put one together and then we could provide it to you as a dynamically generated download. Okay, well, I'll just get a library that makes composer files. Turns out no such library exists. Um, so I wrote a library uh, to do that. It's not really that complex. It's, like I said, just building JSON. It sort of structs out everything uh, that makes up a composer file. There's a pretty sound spec um, for what a composer file should entail. And so we can use that and we can just make a library that handles all of that stuff. So I'm um, just gonna go over some basics of how that works and then we'll talk about how to get more in depth and do more advanced options and stuff. So it's pretty simple, it's a composer library. You can just require it like anything else. Um, you load it up, load its namespace up, and then you can create a new, uh, we called it a companist, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, and you can make that and that's basically a composer file, but you know, it's, it's a dynamic object at this point. We can output it into a file later. Um, and so we can just make one from scratch and we can just start adding things programmatically or we can make one and load up an existing composer file that we want to edit. That's probably what you're going to do most often is you're going to take something that you already have as a base, use that and then add stuff, remove stuff, tweak it from there. Um, and so we'll get into those details here. Um, the basics. So we can create, like I said, a new composer file and we can set any part of it. We can set the description, we can set all the support links, we can um, you know, set what our requires are gonna be, we can you know, set the name, versions, uh, anything we want. Um, sets, uh, uh, setting stuff like this is, it's not too bad, but it's, it's best for stuff that you wanna overwrite the whole thing or it's something where only one of it exists. Like a composer um, file can only have one description, one name, you know, one set of support links, you know, one support URL, that kind of stuff. But it can have lots of modules, repositories, things like that. So um, this doesn't always work for uh, that kind of a set. Um, so you can, you know, if you have a, a whole set of repositories from like a different one that you wanna add in, that's fine, um, or, you know, require modules. But if you want to add some and stuff, then this way doesn't work the best because it's a full override. Um, but it is pretty powerful. So, what else we want? Ooh, I think I went too far there. Um, oh no, that's okay. Um, so we can do uh, merging and we can do adding. I should have included an add on this slide, but um, where we can take two composer files, uh, we can put them together, we can take an existing composer file and we can add stuff to it. We can add three more requires. Um, we can add a repository. We can do all that kind of stuff dynamically so we can move on from what we, you know, our base that we had and we can add all these extra bits and that's stuff that we couldn't add normally. Like requires we could always add extra but if we wanted to add, you know, a custom repository that things pull from or we want to, a really good example is if you want to pull stuff from NPM so you want to like pull JavaScript libraries. Um, making those as a require in Drupal is kind of hard. You still have to manually add those somehow. But if you do this, you can add that as a, there's a way you can use those as a composer dependency as well. And you can add them, put them in the libraries um, section like normal and you can have your module uh, or your site do that kind of stuff. Obviously you can't just do that to your drupal.org module um, because it's not gonna support this. But if you're making your own distribution, your own in-house setup or something, then you can do that. Um, where it becomes really good though is when you can do merging. And so that's where you can take uh, like two different distributions and you can put them together. So where this came into use for us was say like if we have commerce, which lots of people just add to something else, they might be building a different site and then they want commerce functionality. They want to have a cart and checkout and that kind of thing. So it's like, okay, what if I built my site with, you know, lightning, you know, I built it with thunder, I've built it with, you know, open social, something like that, and I want all this commerce stuff, but commerce has kind of some specific dependencies and the easiest way to do it is to create a commerce project, you know, but then you don't have all the stuff from Lightning. So what we can do is we can even load up both of those composer files and we can merge them together. And so this is going to mostly merge stuff pretty well. It's, you know, you can decide which one you wanna have, you know, if you wanna overwrite or if you just wanna be additive, 
um, you know, you might want to customize a few things. This is a, a pretty short example. Um, if you look at the source for our Commerce Kickstart uh, distribution, you'll see some more complex stuff of you might want to merge everything together and then, you know, say your own title, your own version, your own description because you've made a unique thing now. So you maybe generate that automatically. Um, and so those things will be a new thing, but you can add, you know, now we've just put all your repositories together. So you just, whatever we had from one and whatever we had from the other goes together. Your scripts, um, everything like that goes together. You, there are some caveats you will have to deal. So what if two libraries or two distributions require um, two different versions of the same require? It's not going to automatically uh, figure that out for you because that's not even something the composer will automatically figure out for you. It'll just say, hey, you have a conflict. Um, you have to deal with that. So unfortunately, we haven't fixed that yet. Maybe if someone wants to submit an awesome PR, that would be amazing. But um, that one's pretty difficult. So you will have to deal with some of that stuff manually. You might have to check through if you have uh, dependencies or if you just know, hey, this is the one I want primarily, and then I want to add in the sort of extras from this and work from there. You can always, once you generate this too, you can try to even automatically compose or install your file that you generated and see if it worked. Um, and then you can sort of do that as a bit of an automated testing way to be like, did we make a valid one or, or does it have to be some manual uh, adjustment? Um, it's like, okay, so we've just sort of mashed everything together into a big setup. Why is this good? Um, or why is that bad? Um, what we had with Commerce Kickstart, which I touched on before, is we didn't like it. It was trying to do sort of multiple things and it, it had these various problems with it. It was also trying to do sort of a few pretty different things at once. Um, the initial, there was actually two versions of Commerce Kickstart. The first version was pretty much just a development framework. It was to help you have some standard modules about, you know, that went well with Commerce because Commerce had lots of add-ons um, that you were sort of needed. You know, you needed to add coupons and shipping and things like that. Um, but everyone wanted it as kind of like a demo and it gave you, it didn't give you any content, it didn't give you themes, it didn't give you stuff like that set up and, and so people were kind of lost because they would get sort of what they saw as nothing when they downloaded it. So the second one um, was made, which was much more of a demo. It came with products, it came with a bit of a theme, you know, it had all this stuff set up so if you set it up it looked like a fully working Drupal Commerce site. The problem is that made it kind of crappy to develop on because now you had to get rid of all this stuff. And people would oftentimes build their sites on top of a bunch of this demo content which wasn't really a good way to do things. You, you just added all this extra clutter and, and people would just kind of extend stuff where they should have sort of started from scratch and it wasn't good at being this development framework but it was trying to do that a little bit so it wasn't perfect at being a demo and it was trying to do these um, multiple different things and you get it, we'd get a lot of uh, like support requests and stuff like that, which would say, you know, we are trying to do this on Commerce Kickstart, and then suddenly that was like a whole new version of problems, or they would need, hey, this is outdated on Commerce Kickstart, or this doesn't work with Commerce Kickstart, and it was like this whole separate thing. You had to maintain Drupal Commerce, and then you had to maintain Commerce Kickstart as well as like a separate support channel, um, which was just seemed unnecessary and was taking us away from Drupal, adding more overhead, um, and all that stuff. Uh, the third thing is if you try to um, make these, any of these distributions and everything really slick and you want to add in, you know, custom user interface, stuff like that, uh, you can go away from it being sort of a standard Drupal install. And so now it doesn't necessarily work with everything. And you're, you're losing a little bit of what is Drupal to make your site specific. And so we didn't want to get where it's like, oh, what am I doing? I'm using Lightning. Well, no, you should just be using Drupal that is also Lightning um, instead. And so we wanted to have all that uh, flexibility and functionality still there. Um, so that kind of means that what you can do is you can have exactly what you want. You can include everything that you need and you can get rid of everything that you don't want right at the start. Um, you can do this with you know, doing it programmatically through the library and stuff that I saw. But the better idea is that you can use this if you're building a distribution and then all your clients can just pick options or all your users can pick options when they go through this 
and build their own custom setup that's specific to their needs and doesn't have anything that they don't need, but hopefully has everything that they do need. So there's not this crop that they have to get rid of or that they're dragging along. And they're really just back to a Drupal site, but it's just a Drupal site that does just what they want. Um, so an example of that is we made uh, for the commerce kickstart for Drupal 8. Um, it's not a distribution, it's just a site. Um, and so what it does is it goes through a whole bunch of options that you can pick and then it will build a composer file out accordingly. So if you want shipping, it will add shipping. If you want to be based on lightning, you can be based on lightning. Um, you know, if you don't want certain options, we won't include those. And so as we go along, we can build exactly that and then we literally generate a composer file for you um, at the end that has exactly what you intended. You just, all you have to do is you take that download, you go into the folder, you run composer install, there, you have a whole site. You didn't have to, to fiddle around um, managing you know, dependencies or looking at what Lightning does and looking at what your other thing does and putting it together, um, you know, checking out you know, library dependencies and adding script tags, all that kind of stuff. So it should be really, really easy to click through and just get a distribution. This has worked pretty well from us. We, I think we have about 10,000 um, downloads from it. Um, there are, like I said, cases where it doesn't work of course, um, and you know we're working on that. I just released a new uh, beta uh, yesterday, actually, of the underlying module for it because there are cases where you know you'll use a distribution, and it won't work, or something will change in that distribution, and since we pull it in dynamically, um, it might not generate one. Uh, it's still a bit of a proof of concept, but we're trying to go that way where we can have these uh, dynamic custom ones instead of just here's our distribution, here's what you get, you're on our track now. Where are we? Okay, we're doing not too bad. Um, I'll just go a little more and I'll just leave this slide out for a bit. Um, so that's kind of the goal we were trying to achieve here and then I wanted to do a talk so that we could say, is this something that anyone else cares about that would be useful for other people? It's come up a little bit. People have sort of tagged and mentioned the library but um, it hasn't got a lot of uptake. I don't, you know, it's also, is there a completely different way we should do this? Um, how should we handle stuff like that with composers? Is something that composers should support uh, natively instead? Is it a stupid idea in general? Um, that sort of thing. Um, so can open it up to questions. Uh, we you know, don't have a ton of time here because it's only a 30 minute session, but uh, where we go. So yes, it, it does fit some use cases that I see at UC Berkeley and Central IT. We, one thing I've been um, wrestling with is how to uh, have a base distribution that can be extended in, in V8. And um, my first question with this is, uh, if uh, you've got a whole bunch of sites um, with the base distribution and then some customization around them, mm -hmm. and you want to upgrade them all at the same time, what does that workflow end up looking like? Is it as simple as composer update on every site, or are there gotchas? It should be as simple as composer update on every site. If you are pushing a change that is like adding a script tag or one of those root only options, then it can be more difficult because there's no real way to pull those. Unless you set up like a CI setup that would um, pull an updated composer file like dynamically, you could do that. You could generate them all uh, again basically and, and anytime you change a composer file, do it that way, bring it in and run a composer update. That would work. Um, but you would have to have a CI step to push those along because obviously otherwise it, it's not attached at all. Um, and you could possibly run into uh, a got you if you, know, you had some sort of conflict or they had changed too significantly that you might not notice or whatever. So you'd have to probably manage them all centrally that way versus like let people um, customize them manually and dynamically at the same time. Uh, again, you could look for like you could manually flag those conflicts if you wanted to as well. So. Uh, just a, a quick follow up on that, and this is like probably a newbie question around Drupal 8 and stuff, but like when a security release comes out, you know, for Drupal core, I suppose, would you just be merging in the composer JSON from the right, uh, the right composer JSON from Drupal core um, in order to get the updated stuff quickly into your mishmash of yeah, I mean, you're not necessarily going to even have to do that if it's just like a new Drupal core. 
um, especially that it, it won't normally change the composer file because it kind of can't because that's already right. been customized. So just a regular composer update is going to pull all those new guess, versions. Yeah, I guess it's more in contrib where like you might have a lot of different things to update. You know? Yeah, all that should still go fine from a composer update because all that stuff is already meant to work that way without a custom one at all. So you're just sort of adding on top of that. So you shouldn't get any issues from there unless they have a special manual step, which would just be the same as normal. So. Less a question for you and more of an answer for you. Um, uh, with managing multiple sites, um, we manage about 70 sites uh, at PNNL, um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and um, not all of them are composerized yet. But in the move to do composer, I found that some of the root options you can actually do with a composer plugin. So, like your script tags, even adding repositories, um, you can create a composer plugin and require that. Uh, also, if you've got other packages that you want to use across all of your sites, you can create a uh, package that requires those and just require that across all your sites. So then you can update that package, uh, and then whenever you compose or update all of your sites, it'll push that out everywhere. So. Yeah, that's actually a way that's done as well for like uh, dev dependencies and stuff yeah. for Drupal core. There are a couple of like sort of meta libraries basically that handle all of that. So yeah. they'll match the like the Drush dependencies and things like that so that they play nicely with each other. So that's the way that Drupal core does the same sort of thing. So you can do that. If you have control over your own distribution, you have a bit more flexibility because you can do things like that where you can say, hey, require this plugin. Whereas like if you're a module or something or even you know a distribution that you people won't be using as a distribution, you still have that sort of root problem that you have to provide yes. somehow. So there, there's different use cases there if you're a public one versus a private, you have a bit more flexibility. Exactly. So. And I appreciate mm. you doing this because I can see some use cases on that as well. So Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, sorry, can you please speak into the mic? They just want us to do that for recording. So. So I can see that'd be useful if you're running multiple projects, but like how, that wouldn't really be useful if you're running like a multi-site, right? Like this is only one distribution, one install. Yeah, like if you're only using a single composer file for like for a multi-site setup, it's not really gonna provide any use. You can just do all your customizations um, manually there. The only thing that might help you is you know, if it's easy to generate it when you first start the project. You know, like if I'm pulling down a Drupal Commerce test project to like, um, you know, just do specific, you know, regression testing or something I might pull from this because it's just a little bit quicker, but that's all you're going to get. So, like, if you're building it in-house just for that, it's probably not helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, we do still have a couple more minutes if anyone else um, wants to go in for a question. So. Uh, 